Welcome to Brooks River in Katmai National Park, Alaska. My name is Mike Fitz, your resident naturalist with Explore.org, the world's largest live nature cam network. And welcome to this play-by-play -play broadcast. I'm your host, along with my partner in crime co-host, Ranger Naomi Boak from Katmai National Park. Naomi, great to speak with you again, and I'm, I'm glad that uh, the weather broke a little bit so our cams uh, got some sunlight and came back online. Yeah, me too. Um, you know, someone someone's on your side, Mike. Someone likes your play-by-plays. So I think it'll be a, a fun broadcast today. We'll be looking, of course, at the Brooks Falls camera and talking about the bear and salmon activity that we see there. We'll also be heading downriver to our River Watch camera from time to time to take a look at bear activity there. And I'm also excited to bring back into our broadcast the underwater camera with this beautiful looking sockeye salmon uh, right in front of the camera. So hopefully he'll hang out for us during the broadcast and we'll talk about uh, him as well. So this is live. All the footage that we'll show you unless otherwise noted is um, is live. And we don't really know what the bears are gonna do during the broadcast, Naomi, but we always hope for some exciting action to help illuminate uh, and educate our audience about um, you know the behavior of the wildlife at Brooks River. It's it's one of the best places in the world to watch uh, bears fishing for salmon. Um, yeah, I've been spending a lot of time at the falls this week, and um, the bear behaviors have been great. And a bear just caught a salmon. And before we talk more specifically about the individual bears that we're seeing on uh, bear cam, let's. Uh, give you a short introduction to where these cameras are. So Katmai National Park in Brooks River, located about 300 miles southwest of Anchorage, Alaska. And Brooks Falls is located at about the midway point of Brooks River. The river is about a mile and a half long. And along with our webcam partner, the National Park Service Explored.org hosts and maintains several webcams at Brooks River. The signal from those cameras is sent wirelessly to a couple of radio repeaters on Dumpling Mountain. And those repeaters send the signal to the small town of King Salmon, about 30 miles away. We're also, uh, we have several questions available to us that we'll try to answer during the broadcast. If I remember, they came in in advance through Ask Your Bear Cam question. So if you have questions for Naomi and I, or any of our live events, drop those in, in that form. And we'll, we'll do our best to try to answer as many of those questions throughout the season. You can find a link to that on the left-hand side of the page below the live camera feed. Going back to where the live cameras are though, just looking at this Google Earth image of Brooks River, the Brooks Falls camera, again, we'll be focusing a lot on that. You can see that on the left side of the image. And then we'll be looking downstream at the underwater camera and the uh, river watch camera. So the river watch camera gives us a really great line of sight of the uh, a vast majority of the lower river area looking upstream from the bridge down there. And then the Brooks Falls will give us uh, a great line of sight of uh, particularly the falls area. But if it does pan downstream, we'll be able to see a lot of the river in that direction as well. Going back up to the falls though, Naomi, a really great look at uh, one bear family here. The bear on the far side is unrelated to them as far as we know, but it looks like Divot and her yearlings here being successful. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's amazing to watch this this family fish because those those yearling cubs are fishing on their own at the falls and being very successful. And we've been seeing that with a couple of different families with yearling cubs at the falls this year. Uh, Divid, as you mentioned, is one of them. And then number 128, who's nicknamed Grazer, and her yearlings are also catching uh, fish frequently at Brooks Falls. So I think both of these families really have given uh, their cubs uh, a great start. And if I remember correctly, I think both of those families also wean their yearlings after two summers. So Divot will certainly go to the den with her cubs one more time. Uh, but this might be, I, I should have checked my notes beforehand, but this might be their last summer with mom. So they could be on their own next year. And, but she's given them such a great head start in life already. Look how pudgy they are. Yeah. Oh, I know they're they're huge. the The other thing that I'm going to add in here behind this family group, we see Bear One Five One Walker, who has been um, 
he's about 14 years old and in his prime and he's gained a lot of weight in the last couple of years and he's been kind of throwing his weight around so to speak and he did try to steal a fish from divot the other day and she would not have it and she got him to back down so i think when observing this family you will not see 151 approaching divot or trying to steal a fish from her i think divot settled that issue it's interesting to see the behavior of some of the big adult males around some of these more defensive females at Brooks Falls, particularly Grazer, but also Divot. I mean, Divot's right up there in the thick of things. So she feels uh, confident that she can gain access to this fishing spot and hold it. And we don't see all mother bears uh, doing that. Uh, a lot of the, the female bears will avoid Brooks Falls, especially with um, younger cubs. And Divot often does that too. She won't typically bring her spring cubs up to Brooks Falls, but with yearlings, they're a little less uh, vulnerable to attack. They're certainly more independent, better to make uh, better able to make decisions on their own. They're better able to withstand the force of the water too. Uh, so they're unlikely to get swept downstream, for instance, not like a smaller uh, cub. So so Divot can recognize you know the the vulner the overall vulnerability of her family and see that you know it's a little less this year than it was last year. So I can take these risks being close to some of these. Uh, large adults up at the falls. But yeah, Walker is definitely feeling uh, a bit more bold over the last few years. But yeah, he even though he might try to intimidate some of the other adult males, uh, these, these big females really are not shy about getting in his face and backing him down. No, uh, she also backed down 747 the other day when I was there. Um, uh, she, you know, um, she's a very experienced bear and um, she's, defends her cubs. She doesn't like her cubs socializing with other cubs. That's another thing that she will get defensive about. And, you know, as we watch her, we watch 128, we watch um, 435. Those mothers are, have different strategies about protecting their cubs. And, and those strategies change according to circumstance. David certainly gained a lot of weight too. All, all of the bears at the falls. I mean, you can particularly see it in a lot of these adult females. They've been feeding very well over the last month. This is a photo of David. It doesn't really show her body size that well because she's mostly in the water. This is a photo of her taken in, um, let's see, this is, this is June of 2018. So just to give you a little bit of an idea of how her body mass has changed. Of course, it changes drastically from early summer uh, too, too late summer. One of the things also about Dibbit, Naomi, that we talk about frequently is um, her story as far as survival. Uh, because a few years ago, she came to Brooks River with a wire snare around her neck. And that was actually, there was a question about that that came in through our Bear Camp question form. Um, Kelly was wondering, you talk about Dibbit being snared. How common is this and what measures are being taken to prevent it? Or is it impossible to prevent because the area to search is just so large? Uh, and I'm going to try to answer this um, in, in brief. There's a really great video about the rescue of Divot uh, in 2014 that you can find on Katmai National Park's uh, YouTube channel, official YouTube channel. So you can look for that to get an idea of kind of like what happened and what we had to do to remove the wire snare from Divot. But as far as we know, she left the park boundaries and she was caught in a snare that was set out of season. It was supposed to be re removed. Um, you know, trapping is a is an activity that happens in a much of rural, rural Alaska, including the King Salmon area where Divot happened to, we think we, she wandered into. Um, so the snare wasn't removed. She got caught in it. She broke free of the of the snare whenever it happened to be tied, but the, the snare itself was still cinched around her neck, so which ended up tranquilizing her. And now she, it's very satisfying to see her because she is just you know, doing so well as a, as a healthy adult bear, even though her survival at the time was quite compromised. We weren't really weren't sure whether it was... Um, you know, whether she was going to survive, especially with that snare. Um, but going back to like the other parts of that, that question, uh, you know, the, the, the trapping seasons are enforced uh, pretty strictly by Alaska state wildlife troopers. And, um, and the regulations on that is, are very clear and there's no trapping permitted with trapping permitted within Katmai national park. So a bear really has to wander outside of the boundaries of the park to risk anything like that. 
uh, and then then lastly, you know, the area is very very large. Um, the the rangers also patrol the park on a on a frequent basis. And, and Naomi, you're around a lot of the law enforcement rangers and backcountry rangers who are out and about in the park, um, making sure that people are having a good experience and also making sure that they're complying by law. Yeah, they're um, they're out and about a lot this season, um, and um, you know, so so we see them less here than we we might want, but um, they are patrolling and even. You know, at the end of the season, what, what we might think of the end of our season, they're still out patrolling because there seems to be more hunting going on at that time in the preserve. So they 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 roam around making sure that people aren't breaking rules and uh, keeping things in order. I did want to say another thing about Divot's cubs and Divot, because um, I got a question the other day on the Falls platform if about... Um, do female bears mate with more than one male and could their offspring be the result of different, have, have different fathers? And she asked us because of the very different colors of Divot's um, offspring. Oops, somebody showed up that she doesn't like. We're going to stop that conversation. Yeah, it's a little hard to tell who, uh, who approached there. We, you know, it's just out of the camera's line of sight. But um, obviously, Divot felt a little threatened by a bear approaching from the top of the boulders there. And I mean, you've you've seen it a lot this year, especially with with Grazer and her yearlings. But it's Oops, there uh, it, you. <laughs> it may be eight eight two one. I'm not positive on that. We'll see if he turns and shows us a little bit of a scar. I Divid think it's giving a little bit of a hop charge there, even though that bear is not yeah. paying attention to her at all. I think it may be a bigger bear. Oh, you're right. Yeah. It's so not, here comes eight. Right here comes eight two one right to the lip of the falls right now. So that was a different bear. I think seven four seven is my guess. And and it would and Divot would react that way to seven four seven, which I've seen her do this week. Yeah, the, definitely. That's a lar much larger bear than uh, than eight two one. And when we, you know, we, as we talk about like the defensiveness of mother bears, we see that a lot with with grazer and divot families on the river. If, if you are like a smaller bear, particularly, and you're not, you don't rank very high in the hierarchy. You know, you see a mother bear with big yearlings coming along. That's kind of an intimidating presence. <laughs> to say the least. I mean, those are, those are big yearlings. They're probably close to, uh, you know, 200 pounds or more at this time of the year. So big family coming towards you like that. It's, it's going to make you think twice about where you're going to move uh, along the river. And that's why mother bears with um, older cubs rank fairly high in the hierarchy overall. Now, another reason that, another thing that makes me think that that's 747 besides its size is it went over to, um, uh, put its nose in front of 151 Walker. And 151 Walker, you know, backed up a little bit, stayed in place, but there was definitely a message being sent by that bear on top of the falls to 151. There was, and I'm looking at uh, a slightly different view on uh, one of my other uh, monitors here naomi as i'm trying to you know keep track of what the bears are doing and, and produce the broadcast uh, i think this is a different bear than 747 obviously well 821 here is moving out of the way as uh, as this bear approaches but we get a better look at this bear we'll see that it doesn't have like the the little bit of that wonky ear that 747 has right on the maybe on the left -hand um, side. So I, this is a different yeah bear definitely a bear wanting to um, strutted stuff, maybe eight zero one. I don't know. I'm guessing. All I know yeah, is that this bear made it just made Divot nervous and it made Walker nervous. Yep. Yeah, also, you know, passively displacing uh, eight two one from the lip of the falls. I actually, I think this is eight one two. If you're not confused already, that's okay. <laughs> we could try to confuse you even more. So we just had bear two uh, adult males uh, on the lip of the falls. It looked like to me certainly that number eight 
two one was on the lip fishing, and then this other bear approached, and I think that is number eight twelve. Um, so he's a big guy. He's uh, he's a young adult male, um, feeling pretty good about himself, um, feeling fairly confident. And it'll be interesting, really, to see how these young adult males kind of rise in the hierarchy as as they age. In fact, another question that we had come in in advance is about bears like eight to one and an eight twelve. Uh, Sienna was wondering, can an apparently easygoing bear like eight to one rise in dominance? So what have you observed overall at the river, Naomi, with some of the younger bears that you maybe watched first on bear cam and now as a ranger, like with, with 151, what would you say is kind of like the common track for a lot of these young adult males in the hierarchy? Well, I think when they get bigger, I think 503 is a really good illustration of this. 503 is a very, you know, very big bear. He's about eight years old, huge for his size. And a very social bear, very playful with a lot of other uh, bears. But in the last year or so, he has not been as tolerant of other bears. And he also uh, appears to be a potential threat to 747. 747 will make a point of pushing away 503. Now, it seems to me bears are very smart. That's a lesson in life for 503. And... As those lessons accumulate, perhaps 503 learns to be a bit more aggressive with other male bears. Um, and 151, certainly in the last two years, he's gotten big, sizes and everything, but it is it is meaningful in the bear, um, bear world. And um, he's been testing how far he can go. And from what I have observed as well, there's really not a, a really great indicator in a young bear that's gonna that that you can look at, you can pinpoint to some personality trait, for instance, that you can point to and you can say, yeah, that bear when it gets older is gonna be very dominant. Uh, I haven't really been able to discern that. In fact, here now as we get a look at um at two two uh, you know big adult males here, when we were talking about 747 earlier, and if you're not familiar with him, he's a very large uh, adult male who uses the falls very dominant this year overall um, this is him from earlier in the year he's much much bigger now when he was a younger bear he was just kind of like a goofy young adult um and this is that 747 now naomi getting up in the, yeah. in the face of this other bear yeah, yeah. okay Thought it so. is you see the monkey here that's definitely but this bear is big that's facing 747 yeah, and it actually makes me question whether that's uh, my ID on that 812 was correct. I don't think so. 812 is not that big. 812 is a big guy, but not that big. And 747 here really um, making sure that this other bear is aware of his presence. 747 not backing down. That other bear, though, uh, you know, skedaddling away from 747. But let's, let's probably see him turn to face 747 as 747 continues to pursue him. 747, this, this direct approach by him is a, is a direct challenge. Yeah. He's not going to let him go. Could it be 801? Could be. That's, a, that's also a good possibility. Um, and if you're wondering at home, you know, why you know, we, we're not able to identify these bears conclusively, well, it's hard. Also, um, we can't watch the bears when we're doing this broadcast in high definition like you might be able to. So sometimes a little bit of those details that you can see if you um, turn your settings up to, to high def, we can't quite see that. The 747 right now continuing to pursue this. Uh, this is a situation where he's not he's he's not approaching this other bear because he wants a fishing spot this this other bear has. These bears don't fish really in that location very very often. They prefer, you know, the plunge pools kind of below the below the falls. So 747 here is really just looking to assert his dominance over the other bear. Yeah, there was some jawing by the other bear a bit. We couldn't see uh, 747's face, but, um, and if I were 747, I'd be concerned about a bear of that size. It's a very big bear. And these bears here, some are some of the largest in the world. Uh, Kodiak bears are famous for their overall size and the biggest brown bears ever documented come from Kodiak Island. But Kodiak Island's 
not very far away from Katmai National Park. In fact, um, the bears in Katmai are the closest uh, population to Kodiak Island. They're separated by about 30 miles of water, uh, the Shelikoff Strait, which is a very rough, um, you know, stretch of water. So bears really are probably aren't swimming back and forth. There is, in fact, there's no genetic evidence of that in in recent times to suggest that that happens. But bears in Katmai and on Kodiak Island have some very similar habits, um, and they also are highly reliant on salmon. And a bear like 747 and some of these other large adult males weigh well over a thousand pounds at this time of the year. So really big guys. Um, I took a picture of 747 um, in the last week in the same position he was in, in a picture I have from late September last year. And he looks pretty close in size to what he did in uh, late September last year. That's one of the remarkable things about watching bears at, at Brooks Falls is you get to see these bears not only for like a day or a few hours, but really across seasons and years. And you get to see some of these bears coming back again and again and again. A bear like 747, he's been using the river every year that we know of since 2004. A uh, bear like Divot has been using the river every year of her life, as far as we know. Uh, we haven't talked about Otis yet. He's up in the uh, upper right-hand corner there, facing away from us. He's used the river every year of his adult life, along with Walker, too. So th these bears are not like anonymous individuals that we might find uh, in other national parks. Um, we get to know these bears very well on an individual level, and I think that's a really special thing about this place. Yeah, it is. Um, and a special thing about Explore. Now, I think that that right bear between Divot and Otis, um, I, again, because of the pixelation, it's hard for me to tell, but I'm going to guess and um, 719 because I've seen her in person in that spot a lot in the last few days. Yeah, I think that is a good um, a a good idea. I I I, I agree with that. That that's seven one nine, seven one nine is also one of these really fun bears to watch. She's an adult female. She weaned her cubs this spring from her first litter, so she's single this year. She could come back with cubs next year. We're not really going to know, of course, until until she does so. But um, even if uh, she is pregnant right now, we wouldn't see signs of pregnancy in 719 because they go through a process of delayed implantation. So any fertilized eggs that might be uh, in any of the adult females right now are just in a state of arrested development and they won't implant in her uterus until she goes to the den uh, this fall. And then they give birth in midwinter. Now, another really great look here of the giant 747 in his preferred fishing spot. Now, there do seem to be some salmon coming through. And speaking of salmon, you know, a 747 is looking to fish here. Why don't we go downstream? Because we haven't cut to our underwater camera yet. And uh, thanks to the rangers who cleaned this camera off recently, it gets a bit of a, well, for a lack of a better word, a biofilm on it. Just like a, a little bit of... of of, of bacteria and algae, you know, all the slippery stuff that live on the bottom of a, of a river kind of grows on the, the camera housing. So that needs to be cleaned off periodically. And it's hard to reach. There's really no good way to get to it unless you're in a boat. The water's too deep. You can't really, sw you could swim there, but there's a lot of bears around. So you have to be quite careful about that. Most of the time when it's been cleaned this summer, someone's been in a kayak to scrub it off, reach down there. A beautiful look at a bright red sockeye salmon. And you were, we were talking before the broadcast, you've been seeing uh, not a whole lot of very bright red sockeye salmon. It seems like most of them are still a bit paler in color. Yeah, they are. And it's interesting. Look at the difference in color of these two salmon. One bright red and the other darker. Um, and yeah, I mean, we've been seeing um, a mix of, um, you know, silver, dark uh, silver fish. We've been seeing some red ones, a lot of small ones, but not, none as um, late in the spawning cycle as, as this uh, male. And that bright red color that he has is an indication that he's going to spawn fairly soon. So he might move up river in the 
areas downstream of Brooks Falls and spawn there. These fish that are that we're looking at uh, are probably unlikely to try to jump Brooks Falls, although they might, but it's unlikely. There's a lot of good spawning habitat downstream of Brooks Falls, and that's probably where these fish were uh, were born, where their where their egg where they were laid as eggs, where they were buried, where they incubated, and and where they were born. So they don't feel the need to jump upstream in the falls. I think sometimes people will will get the mistaken impression that well, if, the, if a salmon is spawning downstream in the falls, it's somehow inferior or unable to make the leap. And with a lot of the fish, that's not the case. In fact, the majority of the salmon that spawn downstream in the falls do so just because that's the place where they were born. And it's a remarkable thing about sockeye salmon is that the vast majority of them return to the exact same place where they were born. I love looking at, you know, the, the males when they're at this stage. It's such an incredible transformation. And you can tell this is a male by his more exaggerated hump. Also, his more exaggerated exaggerated mandibles they get a bit more hooked than the females this is just a great comparison Naomi because the one um, below the male is a female so it doesn't have as big of a shorter hump doesn't have as as exaggerated uh, hooks on its on its jaws and when you compare these salmon with what they look like earlier in the summer I mean their transformation is quite remarkable uh, it's it, they don't really look anything like like the like the fish uh that that we see that we see right now and I'm, I'm looking for to see if i have any silver salmon photos here or salmon that were or excuse me early season salmon just to give you a difference and the only thing i can find here is just a little bit of a video of salmon jumping at the waterfall and you can see this now too it's a bit hard to really tell um just from this video, just how, how differently uh, the salmon have transformed themselves. That red coloration they have on their skin right now, that's from the pigments in their flesh transferred out to the skin. And the females will also transfer those red pigments from her flesh to her eggs. Very nice of them to, to uh, stay in front of the camera like this. The camera is mounted to a piling for the bridge across Brooks River. And I think that piling creates a little bit of an eddy in that spot. So just that maybe a spot of where the current isn't as strong. And salmon are really good at recognizing places where they, they, they give them advantage. Uh, when they re-enter fresh water, they don't feed. So they're essentially starving right now and they need to fuel their migration and spawning efforts when they go into fresh water for the final time to, they, 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 they need to survive really solely on their, their energy reserves within their bodies. So they'll hold in places where the current isn't as strong, maybe in parts of Knack Knack Lake, for instance, just downstream of where this camera is located. And they'll also find areas of the river where the current isn't as strong as well. It's, it's rare for, you know, you probably wouldn't find a salmon who's gonna spawn in Brooks River in August going upstream of the falls and just hanging out, you know, just downstream of the falls because they're subject to, to predation there. They're also subjected to a lot of strong currents in that area. So it would take a lot of energy to hang out in those spots. They really just try to move through those areas as quickly as they can. Uh, but the <laughs> area downstream of the falls is a, a great spot, or excuse me, at the mouth of the river is a great spot for them to hang out and not have to worry about getting, uh, getting caught by a bear. So, uh, Mike, a question. Might this male be hanging out with this particular female? Possible. That That's certainly the case. We did see a lot of spawning activity in the this area last year, but that was really kind of like the first year I had ever seen a lot of spawning activity near the bridge at Brooks River. But the, the river bed itself in that area is changing over the last several years as the, the main river channel sort of shifts towards this spot, which it hadn't uh, really done so before. It's a lot deeper in this area that maybe the, the gravel component is uh, it, a bit better for the females to dig their nests and not have to worry about their eggs suffocating. Really what the females are looking for is they're looking for uh, clean gravel that doesn't have a lot of silt or mud in it so, um, so they can dig their nests 
and, and lay their eggs within it. And the males will follow the females wherever they happen to be. But there's a lot of salmon that just like the stage in this area too. So it's hard to say. Um, I, if we could put a tag on these fish, I think that would be the, the way to answer that question with, with certainty. Yeah, well, job for you next year, Mike. Huh. And heading back up the Brooks Falls here, our, our gathering of bears has shuffled around a little bit. 747 was eating a fish. I uh, and then there's been other bears hovering downstream of the falls as well, looking to gain access to that spot. It looks like a smaller bear, a younger bear, um, young adult or older subadult standing just upstream of the island. And then a couple of other bears in the vicinity. And I don't know if we've mentioned this before, but the tree that used to be on the island is completely gone now. It was a great back rubbing tree for bears to show their that they own that island, own that space, and it's just gone. Yeah, R.A.P. Willow, because um, <laughs> that that whole island actually used to be covered in in small trees, and it, it now it's barely holding on to some grass, and that's completely from the bears doing their thing on the island. So marking the trees, uh, posturing for space, resting on that that area. So in a sense, bears can be some in, in some ways engineers of, of their own habitat uh, they will create a lot of trails where they walk frequently the riverbank is lined with well-trodden bear trails and you can see a uh, part of one on the near bank there as our camera operator follows this bear towards the base of the falls Mike, um, how significantly um, has the Brooks River changed in the time that that you've been observing it? We know that rivers change. It's wonder, one of the wonderful things about rivers. But how much have you observed changes in the Brooks River? From the head of the river downstream to, let's say, the river mouth, the, the most noticeable and glaring changes have been at the river mouth itself. So the area that we like to call, um, you know, near the bridge, the lower river area, we're looking upstream towards Brooks Falls. Brooks Falls, as the water flows, maybe a half mile, three quarters of a mile, something like that, um, upstream to the falls from here. But this view that we're looking at right now on our River Watch camera, in 2007, when I first went to Brooks River, that was a, a marsh. There was uh, just just grass, like you kind of see in the middle and background of this image. There wasn't a, a channel moving through there. And if, if there was kind of a, a little small channel, I mean, you could really hop over it. It wasn't very big at all. But this is becoming the main river channel right now. So the, me the river is meandering at the mouth considerably. The rest of the river, however, really hasn't changed that much. I mean, the falls has been, as far as we know, remarkably consistent sort of in its um, in its height and its appearance, just based on geologic and archaeological evidence. It really hasn't changed very much in the past 3,000 years. Uh, so Naknek Lake has uh, kind of continued to recede as it, as Naknek River erodes through the earthen dam, uh, natural dam at the mouth of, or uh, at the outlet of the lake, um, and so Naknek Lake will kind of continue to recede. We might see Brooks River grow in length over the next several hundred or, or next few thousand years. Also, although the lake basin gets very, very deep very quickly out there, so it won't, it won't grow significantly. Um, but well, I think the biggest changes that we can expect to see will continue to be at the river mouth rather than at the falls or in the upper river area. So did, um, as we're looking at the falls, did um, 747 do a little hop charge at that bear that's on the lip? He did, yeah. Just, a, again, another opportunity for him to sort of assert his dominance. That does seem like, in some ways, almost like a, a waste of behavior for 747. And again, if you're not familiar with him, he's the bear uh, with who's in the, the plunge pool below Brooks Falls right now. 
He's very dark. He has so somewhat lighter brown tipped ears at this time of the year. Uh, but when you see him out of the water, he's distinctive just because he is just so big. A lot of people, Naomi, would consider that that behavior to be kind of a waste of energy, though, to go up towards this other bear and and basically tell it, hey, I'm the boss. You better stay away, even though that other bear is going right, to uh, come back to that exact same fishing spot. But over time, this gives 747 a, a big advantage because next year, for instance, if that other bear is walking into an area where 747 might want to fish, or if he sees 747 coming along, then that other bear is probably more likely just to get out of 747's way than to stand there and try to challenge him. So it seems like 747 and a lot of these other big adult males will assert their dominance sort of preemptively. And it's, it's one of those things that may give them uh, an advantage in the future, even though it might cost them a little bit of extra energy right now. And it also seems like, um, uh, especially with 747, those displays of uh, dominance wax and wane. Um, here's sometimes he's, he feels more comfortable and is less assertive. He's you know, comfortable in his position owning the place. Um, and that's a little different than the behavior of bear 856, who was the, the most dominant bear here for 10 years, who would, I think, more frequently assert his dominance um, more, more forcefully sometimes. That was one of the real noticeable differences between 747 and 856. 747, although he was quite dominant, he, he never really threw his weight around as much as, as 856 did. 856 was extremely assertive. And 747 is not shy about throwing his weight around right now, of course. But, he, you know, he doesn't have the same, I don't think, disposition to do it all the time in all situations, really like, like 856 uh, had a tendency to do. Also, this is uh, later in the summer. We should also consider that bears at this point in the year tend to be a bit more tolerant of each other at Brooks Falls because they've had for most of these bears, more than two months to kind of get to know one another. So they've already kind of worked things out. They kind of know where each other stands for the most part. So unless they're really competing over a specific fishing spot, uh, they they tend to tend to be a bit more slack with each other or cut each other a bit more slack, I should say, than we what we might have seen earlier in the season. Although we're not seeing that with the females, I don't think. And that might be reflective of their greater hunger level overall. You know, a, a mother bear, you know, she's not only working for her own survival, but for her cubs. 747, you know, he only has to uh, work for himself. So, and as, as we uh, come up on um, September and we're thinking about Fat Bear Week and you want to think about where your vote sits, you can put that in, into consideration if you want to. Uh, yeah. And uh, Mike, are you the uh, PR agent for uh, 747 again this year? I'm still weighing my options right now. 747 is, I think, deserved of, of going very far in, in Fat Bear Week this year. But I'm not ready to endorse him yet. We'll see what happens over the next month. And we're uh, more than halfway through our broadcast right now. So if you tuned in late, Thank you for being here. If you stuck with us uh, this whole entire time since we started at the top of the hour, thank you also for being with us. My name is Mike Fitz with Explore.org. My co-host for today's play-by-play -play is Ranger Naomi Boak from Katmai National Park. We're talking brown bears and salmon, talking about the behavior of the bears, helping you to get to know some of these individual animals that we're looking at live at Brooks River in Katmai. Naomi, this might be a good time before I forget to segue to an interesting uh, interaction that we saw on Bear Cam just, I think, yesterday. Uh, this was between a bear that we've mentioned so far in our broadcast, but we haven't seen yet, um, number 128, who's nicknamed Grazer, and number 909. So yes, this was from uh, yesterday afternoon. I think this this would be a good clip for us to break down overall, because a lot of people are, are wondering about the behavior of these females. And you just mentioned how some of the females aren't necessarily that tolerant of one another um, in comparison to uh, the behavior that we're seeing with a lot of these other adult males. So let me set this up for everybody real quick. Um, we're seeing 909 and her spring cub, her first year cub on the Lipper Brooks Falls fishing there. And they're approached right now 
by number 128 Grazer and her two yearling cubs. And these two bears have faced off on the lip of the falls earlier in the year. In fact, uh, Grazer actually got so close to this family, the 909's family, at one point uh, a couple of weeks ago that her 909's cub fell off of the waterfall. It's not, it wasn't harmed, but it did show the, the, the competitiveness that even mother bears will go through, of course, to uh, gain access to their preferred fishing spots on Brooks Falls. One of the things, Naomi, that you've been witnessing and I've been um, talking about as well in some of our previous broadcasts and also just in our conversations with one another is uh, the behavior of the cubs and how bold Gracer's yearlings can be. And also uh, we can contrast, I think, that with the behavior of 909's cub in this situation, just sticking so close to mom right now. Well, a 909's cub is a uh, cub of the year, so a year younger than Grazer's cubs, but um, as Grazer's cubs have been emboldened by her behavior and her dominance, and they're becoming more independent. Um, they, When you saw the beginning of this, one of her cubs was pretty far away from her, and they're fishing on their own. Um, I saw one of them swat at Grazer. Yeah, no. I wouldn't swat a grazer. And this is a real tough spot for a mother bear to be on. If you have your back to the edge of the falls, I mean, you really don't have options to go. So 909, for the most part, really has to stand her ground because grazer is giving her very little room. It looks like her cub really does want to move away. 909 wants to move away, but grazer is such a defensive mother bear that any sort of movement in the direction of her cubs seems to provoke her, her defensiveness. So 909 is recognizing that at the same time, you know, that she's trying to defend herself. She's also trying to defend uh, her, her cub as well. Grazer is really not interested in necessarily, uh, you know, attacking 909. Really what she wants to do is she just wants to gain access to her, her preferred fishing spot on the lip of Brooks Falls. And you can see, you know, at this moment in time, Grazer has access to the lip of the falls. She's really just kind of waiting for 909 maybe to move away just a little bit further. But her uh, Grazer's yearlings almost immediately recognize, hey, this is an opportunity for us. I can al already start fishing. I, You know, mom wants to get in the face of that other bear. She can do so. But what I'm going to do is, <laughs> for one of the yearlings, I'm just going to go to the falls and I'm just going to start to fish immediately. So very different behaviors from these cubs based on whether their mom is feeling defensive, like 909, or whether their mom is feeling, um, you know, dominant and, and bold, like uh, like Grazer. I felt kind of sorry for 909 because she really um, fishes so well on the lip of the falls. And... Um, not really as experienced um, in other places. Last year, she got so fat fishing on the lip. And um, the other day, there was a, uh, yes, two days ago, there was a family reunion on the lip because Grazer wasn't around. And um, 909, her sister, 910, and 909's cub were on the lip of the falls, and they are descendants of Bear 409, um, uh, Beadnose, who is the iconic bear that we see in that Mengelson photograph catching a salmon. So uh, it was lovely to see them, uh, those two generations on the lip of the falls. And this is 909 from a couple of years ago. So this is June of 2019. She's grown a lot since then. First time mother for her. It's a little difficult, you know, to navigate the river when you're a first time mother trying to protect your cub, realizing that it's it's a tough job and, and facing all the competition that she happens to face. Um, in fact, uh, Luis was wondering, is 909 nursing her cub enough and feeding her cub enough? And I certainly think so. You know, if we were to uh, look back at this, that video that we were just showing, I mean, 909's cub is not small. It's it's not the biggest, you know, spring cub probably that we have at the river. 909 is not the biggest, mud, uh, but that cub is 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 quite pudgy for um, for this time of the year. And I think it looks to be a healthy, 
normally sized cubs. So even though 909 is facing these challenges as a first time mother, she's also doing, uh, I think, a really great job of, of giving her cub enough nourishment and, um, and nurturing uh, to, to set it up for success. Um, you know, hopefully she'll come back with that cub, uh, you know, next year as a yearling. And I think it'll be fascinating to see uh, if that family is more confident um, as 909 has more maternal experience and as her cub uh, ages and matures into a yearling bear. Yeah, the, the two of them were um, uh, quite near my cabin the other day. And um, it's just hard to tell at this distance, but that cub is sizable and, and chubby. So um, they, they, yeah. I'm confident it's nursing. I mean, they do really kind of look small, but that's the, the cubs. But that's only because they're they're against or they look so small because they're they're right next to the very large bears. I saw a black bear uh, spring cub in my forest right behind my house a couple of days ago, not very far from my house. It was only about a hundred yards away, so that was very exciting to see. Uh, but it, you know, even black bear cubs at this time of the year can be forty, fifty pounds um, or more. In, in my neighborhood. So they're not, they're not small critters. Um, they, they grow, you know, quite rapidly um, with, with mother's guidance. Uh, so in divot yearlings, as we're looking at them again, you know, a couple hundred pounds or more at this time of the year for those, for those big yearlings. So, so Walker you, on the far it? side. Uh, Divot and her yearlings, just to recap here real quickly, Naomi, sorry. Um, Walker in the far pool, okay. Divot and her yearlings by by the boulders, and then another bear sitting on the lip of Brooks Falls. Um, I lost my question. That's all right. <laughs> I get lost when I when I start watching these bears. There was a thought that you had earlier that I think you didn't get a chance to answer this question fully because Divot started interacting with another bear, but you were wondering, uh, somebody had asked you on the falls platform whether uh, Divot's yearlings could have different fathers because they're different colors. So do you want to um, yeah. kind of expand on yeah, that thought? So, yeah, well, you know, yes, it's possible because um, uh, female bears um, can give birth to uh, cubs from di different fathers. Um, I said I couldn't, I told this person I couldn't come to that conclusion because just the color differentiation might not indicate that. Um, I'd have to look at other physical characteristics of these two cubs um, in detail, which I haven't been able to do. Um, but I will say that um, uh, Two years ago, when uh, Divot was a single sow, she was the prom queen. I think almost every large boar was uh, wanting to mate with her. So um, it, there's a good possibility that the, those two have different fathers. And one of them, one of those two just caught a fish. Both male and female bears will, will mate or have multiple partners during the mating season. Mother bears don't mate when they're caring for cubs. So um, Divot didn't mate this year, uh, 909, one to eight grazer. You know, some of these other mother bears that we're seeing, they they don't mate during that that process while they're raising cubs, only when they're single after they've weaned uh, their, their offspring. For male bears, it's a little bit more difficult maybe to gain access to multiple mating opportunities um, just because there's only so many single females roaming the landscape, only so many single females who are at a point in their estrus cycle where they are receptive to mating. So just because it is the mating season doesn't mean a female is, is in the mood, so to speak. Um, she will cycle through maybe two or three estrus cycles during that period of time. And that happens usually in June. That's like the peak of the bear's mating season. Female bears can be courted though by by several different males, and they sometimes will have uh, multiple partners. And some biologists think that might be a way to kind of confuse paternity because sometimes brown bear males will kill cubs. It's not a something that we see commonly on bear cam, although it does happen at Brooks River. Uh, but it seems to happen frequently enough that it. Uh, 
that it alters and, and has um, helped female bears or forced female bears, I should say, to evolve certain behaviors. Um, and having multiple partners might be one of them. Because if you're a male bear like Walker, for instance, you mate with Divot, you might be able to recognize her as um, as a female that you mated with the previous year. And maybe you can put two and two together and say, well, perhaps those are my cubs. Maybe I'll leave that family alone. We don't know that for sure. And there is evidence against that, for instance, um, from, from Brooks River with the male bear killing a cub of a female that he had mated with in the previous year. So there's really no, I think, clear explanation for why bears will kill cubs. But that multiple uh, matings that a female bear will have during, uh, you know, during the mating season could be a way to confuse paternity. Uh, but it seems like most of the DNA evidence that we have about sibling um, bears suggests that the they have the same the same father or they were sired by the same uh, the the same male bear uh, but there is there certainly evidence for multiple males um, siring um, cubs from this from the same litter which is quite fascinating and that 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 happens and that's allowed to happen because of that delayed implantation process that they goes that they go through I mean, you know, when we talk about this, I, I get so many questions and I and I stop myself from answering them because they're, they're questions that are just really hard to answer with wild bears. Like I think, well, could there be the health of the father influences as well, whether that um, that fertilized egg is implants in the female, not just her health. Um, but it's it's just really hard to do research on wild bears. A lot of yeah, a lot of what we know about sort of like the behavioral strategies of these bears is hypothetical or theoretical. I mean, it, it, we can we can assign sort of adaptive advantages to a lot of the things that we see bears see, but we don't really know for sure because we can't ask them directly. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe someday someone will be able to figure out how to do that. But um, they, they, we, we don't, we, you know, we don't, we don't have that ability um, right now. So we can only make, uh, you know, educated guesses in a lot of, a lot of situations. But a lot of what they do is based on, you know, reproduction and and food, um, you know, and much of biology just kind of boils down to to food and sex. So if you're wondering why is a bear doing a certain thing. I, I, that's, those are my, the two things that I go to first when I'm trying to explain a bear's behavior. Does it help them gain advantage for food now in the, in the future or mating opportunities now in the future or help their reproductive success overall? And we can say some similar things about humans as well. <laughs> Very much so. <laughs> We have a few minute, more minutes left in our broadcast. I think it might be a good opportunity to go back to our underwater camera downstream at the mouth of Brooks River to take a look at our salmon one more time. Uh, a white splotch on one of these fish hanging that's hanging out downstream in the camera right now, Naomi. Uh, have you been seeing many fish with fungus on them? And if you're wondering what that is, that is a fungus that's growing on that fish. Yeah, there have been a number of fish with fungus. Um, Usually that occurs where a fish has been injured in some way, uh, up against a net, um, some kind of injury, and it gives the fungus an opportunity to grow. And I, I've seen a number of, of fish like that this year, um, earlier in the season too. That's one of the, again, one of the remarkable things about salmon is that they, they fuel their upstream migration and their spawning efforts, like I mentioned before, solely on the energy reserves within their bodies, and they are not focused on healing their bodies. So salmon will die after spawning. Uh, this is, uh, you know, it's a, from birth until death, it is a round trip journey, but they only, they only get to make it once uh, if they're fortunate enough to do so. So as these fish go upstream, if they sustain any injuries, they're not focused on healing those injuries. They're putting all of their eggs into one basket, and that's really just to, to get to their spawning site and and um, and reproduce uh, successfully. So you could sometimes see some salmon on the underwater camera with some 
terrible fungal infections, you know, from our perspective and also some egregious wounds and they just keep going as best they can. I mean, they, they likely experience some form of pain. Their brains are wired differently than us, but there seems to be a lot of evidence and increasing evidence that the fish do feel pain. Uh, but their tolerance for pain is is much much it might, has to be so much different because we see them sometimes swimming through the river with holes in their bodies and they they just keep on going. I mean, they are amazing creatures to watch and and their endurance is just incredible. I mean, when, it, when you're talking about the salmon like this, it makes me think of the ecosystem as a whole and what it takes for everything in this ecosystem to survive. I mean, think about the resiliency of bears, the tenacity of these bears, the tenacity of these salmon, um, the birds that are dependent on on both of them, um, the trees. Um, I mean, it, it's pretty remarkable when you, you think about what it takes to be a living being along this river and how successful this river system is. It's remarkable to watch each year and it's something I give thanks for uh, to, to be able to have this opportunity to share uh, this experience with everybody. And the, the bears and the salmon, they show us something new every year, uh, particularly, you know, as we look at this bear right below Brooks Falls, Naomi, I don't think yes. I ever have seen a bear in the past fishing that spot so consistently, but there's one bear that really loves to stand or sit. We're not really sure if he's standing or sitting or sitting in that, in that spot. He really, uh, has been using that spot frequently and been successful right in that, that area. Very successful. And what's interesting also is he's facing away from us now. Um, and what I've noticed is when 747 is around, he will be on that side. When 747 is not around, he will be on the other side of the plunge pool facing us. Um, but I, I am trying to find out who that bear is. Um, I've, I've never seen a fishing technique like that either. I've got a couple of guesses. I went through the bear monitors, bear book books from last season, and I saw a couple of possibilities. Someone in the chat had another thought, but I am determined. I've got some good pictures of that bear. I'm determined to find the bear monitor this week and have her look at my picture. Whether she'll give me an answer or not, I don't know. But um, I am determined to find her and show her those pictures. Got a fish. And I, Brilliant. Yeah, it's 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 so fun to see bears innovate, you know, different fishing techniques every once in a while. And that's, you know, that, that spot standing right against the base of Brooks Falls is one of those, those, those uh, ex is an example of that overall. We could see this bear, you know, trying, you know, its hand or its paws uh, at the regular fishing spots, maybe on the lip of the Brooks uh, of Brooks Falls, maybe in the far pool, maybe in the jacuzzi like 747 likes to do. But it seems to have found a niche right at the base of Brooks Falls, even though some of these other very productive fishing spots are available to it. It could go up to the lip of Brooks Falls and look at that amazing catch <laughs> that it yeah. has. With, the, with that salmon, um, or it could fish in the jacuzzi, but it's not. Uh, so when you're watching these bears, yeah, again, you get to look at these bears as, as individuals uh, and, and see them uh, surviving in so many different ways and innovating different ways to survive and make a living. And I, I think that's a fascinating process to see on bear camp. Yeah, I, I'm obsessed with that bear. <laughs> It just so successful in a place where you'd think would be really, really hard to fish and I haven't seen other bears do it. Um, it's really deep there, right, Mike? It is. It is. I, I, I did once crawled, sort of like half walk, crawled to that spot on the base of the falls during a time of the year when bears aren't using the river in large numbers. So in early June, for instance, on a warm day, I wanted to know how deep the jacuzzi was. So I got to kind of that spot near that spot where that bear was fishing and I let go of the edge of the falls. I was at, again, walking at the base. I wasn't on top, so I didn't jump in, but I just sort of like slipped in and I was tumbled around like a rag in a washing machine. Um, it was not a pleasant experience. Uh, I was spit out 
pretty quickly. Um, it felt like it was a long time, but it was probably only a couple of seconds. But it was very deep in there. Um, certainly, I estimate it was over my head. I'm not a very tall guy. I'm not six foot tall. So uh, that bear is could be standing on a tiny legs. I'm not quite sure. It could, there could also be like a rock or something that it's finding some purchase on uh, right there overall. But it's resisting the force of the water, which is very difficult to do in that situation. So it also demonstrates how the bear is strong um, and able to resist um, the water there. Because I don't think I could hold my position in that spot. And I'm pretty sure it's a young bear. It's um, when I when I've seen it out of the water. So. So it's not a big bear like 747 or 801 or a walker. Well, we're coming up on the end of our broadcast here, Naomi. We've been able to see a lot of interesting behavior uh, with divot on the far side of the waterfall. We see this bear innovating uh, a new fishing technique, beautiful views of the salmon underwater. Uh, what are your final thoughts for our audience as, as we sign off tonight? Well, I just think that it's so, I just always amazed at how innovative the bears are, how tenacious they are, how tenacious the salmon are. And it's nearly the end of August and we still have fish jumping the falls and um, all kinds of bears at the falls, family groups, sub-adults, um, adult males, um, yeah, it's great. <laughs> it's it's just um, you know you just got to keep watching. It's remarkable to see the amount of uh, change that we're seeing with the bear activity this year at the falls in August is amazing to see. Uh, I love to see at this time of the year too the transition that the salmon are undergoing as they begin their spawning efforts in large numbers. Never the same day on bear cam. Like you said, uh, Naomi, it's 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 a wonderful thing to see, and I hope everyone continues to watch and and share this experience with us and and help us learn along the way. I would like to uh, thank the camera operators who gave us uh, these great views of the river today, uh, and thanks to Explore.org, thanks to Katmai National Park and the Katmai Conservancy for making all of this possible, and of course, thanks to the salmon for all you do to bring the bears to Brooks River and sustain uh, this ecosystem. My name is Mike Fitz with explore.org. My co-host for this play-by-play -play today was Ranger Naomi Boak from Katmai National Park. We'll be uh, back online to talk to you. Uh... Mike, I'm a huge bear fan and having you explain things is such. Mike, I'm a huge